I've spent the past 50 years traveling around the world trying to find out what's going on and why. What's going on is usually fairly easy to spot. It's happening more or less in front of you. Why something is going on is often complex and more difficult to discover. In 2011, I moved to Switzerland. And the longer I lived in Switzerland, the more interested I became in the country's government. It seems to function better than any government I knew. Virtually every Swiss government employee I dealt with made an enormous effort to help me do what needed to be done. There was a clear sense that they were there to help me. It was particularly frustrating for me to compare the Swiss government with the US government. Now, I am a citizen of the United States and extremely proud of our country, but I think our federal, state, and local governments could use a little mm, reworking. In fact, I think they could use a lot of reworking. Almost every day, I hear a story about how our federal, state, and local governments are wasting trillions of dollars, trillion with a T, as a result of their incompetence, inefficiency, and laziness. But I don't believe that is actually the case. It takes an enormous amount of energy, determination, and planning to waste trillions of dollars. To give you an idea of what a trillion dollars looks like, I put together this illustration. If you had a million dollars in one dollar bills, one on top of the other, it would be about 330 feet high, a little longer than a football field. If it was a billion dollars, it would be 63 miles high, at the distance from New York City to Bridgeport, Connecticut. If it was a trillion dollars, it would be 63,000 miles high, about a quarter of the way to the moon. Face it. You can't waste that kind of money without a lot of planning and effort. I grew up thinking that the government was here to help and protect me, but apparently that tradition is dying out. So I started traveling around the country, talking to people, trying to find out why that tradition is disappearing. I was a hard-working professional. And I the first person I went to see was Walter Raquet. Walter is a successful businessman who started as a certified public accountant, created the first sophisticated equity trading system, and founded a company that was worth $8 billion when he retired. You know, it's amazing all the stuff in politics. I mean, this Walter has spent the last few years researching and documenting the waste and weirdness of our federal, state, and local governments. Walter wrote a book about the failure of our government to do its job and suggested what we can do to correct things. The book is called Government is Killing the Economy. Government policy should, should encourage entrepreneurs to thrive. Look at what made America great. Henry Ford, Bill Gates, Walt Disney. These are examples of people that just created hundreds of thousands of jobs and made America great. I thought it would be interesting to take a look at a number of classic American entrepreneurs and what they created. They are by no means perfect and they are not always responsive to the needs of our society. However, to the best of my knowledge, none of them have asked the federal government to bail them out with taxpayer money. Over the years, stories in publications like Forbes, The Wall Street Journal, and The New York Times have pointed out that it would have been much more difficult, if not impossible, for these entrepreneurs to build the businesses that they did build with today's government regulations in their way. Walt Disney was born in 1901. His father came to the U.S. from Canada. His mother was from a German family. He helped create the American animation industry.
He introduced synchronized sound, Technicolor, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and Pinocchio set the tone for the industry. When he decided to go into amusement parks, he funded the project by going into the television business. These days, Disney is no Mickey Mouse operation. It grosses over $50 billion a year and has almost 200,000 employees. There's a good chance that under today's rules, Snow White would have gotten an X rating and you could have never used the full title. Today, one year after Lisa, we are introducing the third industry milestone product, Macintosh. Steve Jobs was the co-founder of Apple, an entrepreneur and inventor of information technology. He influenced the development of six industries, personal computers, animated movies via Pixar, music, telephones, tablet computing, and digital publishing. Apple has created or supported over one million jobs. Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. And here it is. <laughs> if it wasn't for Steve Jobs, we'd still be doing this. Look up the number in your new directory. Second, raise your telephone and listen for the dial tone. Third, dial each number carefully, making sure you bring the dial all the way around to the finger stop each time. Gates was born in 1955. At the age of 20, he co-founded Microsoft, which became the world's largest PC software company. While criticized for some of his anti-competitive business tactics, he's best known for the personal computer revolution. I'm confident that anybody who, who uses this product will love it. Forbes first listed Gates in 1987 as one of the world's wealthiest people. Today's net worth is estimated at $90 billion, and he may be the wealthiest person in the world. The government should provide goods and services on a cost-effective basis. You know, they should spend our money carefully, like we would spend our own money. The cost of regulation is insane, along with the waste and fraud. They should be encouraging entrepreneurs to create jobs and make the economy grow. A good place to start looking at government waste is the Business Insider. It's a website that analyzes business news and pulls together top stories from the web. It has about 70 million unique visitors each month. The feature I like best is their regular listing of the 12 most ridiculous government regulations. I found this one in Massachusetts. A U.S. District Court judge fined Robert J. Eldridge, a Massachusetts fisherman, $500 for untangling a giant whale from his nets and setting it free. Apparently it's a crime for a professional fisherman to free a whale trapped in his or her nets. Eldridge was supposed to call the state authorities and wait for them to do it. You have reached the Massachusetts hotline for trapped whales. All of our experts are presently busy assisting other whales. Your estimated waiting time to talk to a representative is one hour, 23 minutes, and nine seconds. Example number two. Texas. The state of Texas requires every new computer repair technician to obtain a private investigator's license. All right, let's get your dirty work over. In order to receive a private investigator's license, an individual must either have a degree in criminal justice or must complete a three-year apprenticeship with a licensed private investigator. Spot yourself on there. When I give you this, bust a wide open. Why didn't I learn a trade? If you are a computer repair technician that violates this law, or if you are a regular citizen that has a computer repaired by someone not in compliance with the law, you can be fined up to $4,000 and you can be put in jail for a year. Please keep in mind you are paying the salaries of the people who created these laws. Makes you wonder who should be in jail. 
In the interests of full disclosure, I should point out that my visit to Texas had a second component. I have two sons, two daughter-in-laws, and three grandchildren living in Texas. And I wanted them to be informed of where their tax dollars were going. The federal tax code was established in 1913. It was 14 pages long. And to file a return, it was one page. So how do you think the IRS regulations got to 74,000 pages? It is so simple. The politicians and the lobbyists got together with the business people and did favors. And they basically created favors to the tune of $1.5 trillion. $1.5 trillion, like with a T? With a T. <laughs> so corporations are getting a pretty good tax deal. In 2012, GE made $5.8 billion. Their taxes paid was $51 million. I'd like to have that rate, and so would you. I'd like to have their account. <laughs> <laughs> the time has come when the problem of the American taxpayer must be considered. We must bring an end to this enormous drain on American resources as soon as it is possible. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. This stuff is hard to believe, and the government knows about it. They, they did an audit of the government-issued credit cards to these employees, and they found out that 15% of the expenditures went for personal items such as Ozzy Osbourne tickets, negligees, tattoos, bartender school tuition, etc. Can you imagine our tax dollars being wasted like that? I love the idea of somebody showing up at my farm from the Department of Agriculture in a, in a negligee. <laughs> Keep dreaming. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get that straight. Ozzy Osbourne concert tickets, tattoos, lingerie, tuition at a bartender's school, car payments, and cash advances. About a billion dollars in tax credits are being claimed for energy-efficient residential improvements by people with no record of owning a home. In fact, some of them are convicts in federal prisons. About 7,000 people who claim to be Medicaid providers in just three states owed $791 million in unpaid federal taxes, which our government failed to collect. And yet, at the same time, our government managed to pay them $6.6 billion in Medicaid reimbursements. And that was just in one year. When you Google government wasteful spending, you get over 8 million results. So tell me about this insider trading stuff. Well, it's, it's amazing. Basically, you and I cannot trade on insider information. And that what inside information is means is if we're buying and selling securities based on information that the public, general public does not have. However, 60 Minutes exposed the fact that our Congress people and our senators can trade on inside information. They were so embarrassed that they immediately passed the Stock Act, which prevented them from trading on inside information. However, several months later, they just did away with the Stock Act, and now today, they can trade on inside information. So let me see if I got this right. <laughs> inside information is stuff that insiders know and nobody else knows. That's right. And if we use that information to buy or sell stock, we go to jail. You got it. But if you are a member of Congress or the Senate or, or one of their employees, right anybody in that part of the federal right. government, you can take this inside information, which you probably have more access to right. because you're passing the law, inside trade, right. and you don't go to jail. That, that's correct. I'll give you an example. A corporate CEO knows what the earnings are that, that are coming out. Let's say he needed a favor from a congressman. He could call that congressman and say, buy the stock, our earnings are going to go way up. 
the congressman could buy that stock. And, and there's no law against it. It's perfectly legal for them. So then they passed a law that said, we won't do this anymore. And everybody had a big party, and the president signed it. Right. And a couple of months later, they said, hey, Howard, get rid of that law. <laughs> That's right. That's what happened. I can't believe we're having this conversation. <laughs> I know. It's, you can't make this stuff up. You, but they can, and that's the problem. <laughs> okay. Walter also Good pointed stuff. out that because of slow growth in the economy that's caused by excessive regulation, waste, and fraud, the American middle class has not had a real raise in 15 years. <laughs> time to blow the whistle, and the people I spoke to had some interesting suggestions. Two of them were at major law firms, and a few worked for our government. They spoke on condition that their names would not be mentioned in this report, because they are not authorized to rat out their associates. They all believe that our governments are out of control and wasting our money. Government workers are everywhere that there is a need for information and service to the American citizen. They also pointed out that the people who knew most about the waste are government employees. They felt we need to create a program with high dollar rewards for ideas that will improve efficiency and reduce waste. And they all stressed the idea that we need to reward and protect the people who do this. You know, I uncovered a fraud that was, and the government collected over a billion dollars in 1980. And what did they do with this tool, this valuable tool of whistleblowing? They did nothing, okay? And just to give you an example of how powerful whistleblowing is, all of the financial frauds, you could take the Madoff fraud, the Enron fraud, those frauds would not have happened if there was a whistleblower. Any one of Madoff's six employees that knew what he was doing would have turned him in for a $5 million reward and immunity. I mean, why are we so stupid not to have laws that will protect us. Yet, um, they want to make regulation and regulation and regulation, and they don't want to do common sense ideas to protect us. I like that when you went into the post office and it said wanted $10,000 reward, <laughs> and you look, look really careful to see if you knew that man or woman. Right? That's what you're talking about. A absolutely. So it worked in the post office in the Old West. That's right. <laughs> we have to get back to those wanted posters. Well, you know, if we went to the government employees and we offered them 25% of the first year's savings of any idea they came up with, can you imagine? We'd have thousands and thousands of ideas on how to eliminate wasteful spending. Walter thinks we need a presidential commission to fix things. Each area of the government would have a team of successful men and women who understood how business worked and what would help our country be more efficient they'd make recommendations to the government. The boards could also help with the whistleblower program. We need to hear directly from the people who work in our government. They could suggest ways to better run their offices, identify lawbreakers, and eliminate red tape. And just for the record, here's a little background on the expression. These days, the phrase red tape is used to refer to excessive bureaucratic regulation like filling out unnecessary paperwork. Over the years, I've made hundreds of international flights, and each time I enter the United States, I am required to fill out a form listing the value of what I am bringing into the country. I bet that hundreds of millions of these forms have been filled out. And what happens to them? Are they read by anybody? Or are they stored someplace? At the very least, is the paper recycled? Inquiring minds need to know. The term red tape appears to have originated in the early 1500s at the court of the King of Spain, who had important documents wrapped with red tape. Suddenly, kings all over Europe started wrapping important documents in red tape. Henry VIII of England was a master red tape wrapper. He sent over 80 red tape documents to Pope Clement VII, requesting the annulment of his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. I found Walter's comments rather shocking. I wanted a second opinion. So I paid a visit to Philip Howard. 
Philip heads an organization called Common Good, which is a nonpartisan group dedicated to the radical idea that responsible individuals should run our country, not mindless bureaucracy. Government officials and citizens should be motivated by common sense. What a radical idea. American government's basically run by dead people. It's people who wrote these rules and regulations 40 and 50 years ago that are long gone, and they stay in place whether or not they, they work. And the worst kind of evil of them is that they don't give people today the flexibility to make sense of the situation in front of them. People literally cannot use their common sense. It's illegal. So people go through the day with their noses in these thick rule books. Um, for example, in nursing homes, typically have about a thousand rules. So you know, food shall be stored not less than 19 centimeters above the floor, and that that so divert nurses' aides and the people who run nursing homes that they don't have time actually to do what the resident would like and needs. <laughs> Decrepit water mains, sometimes over a century old, waste trillions of gallons of water every year. Waste water facility plants are out of date, don't have capacity, so whenever there's a big rainfall, there's overflow in, in, into the rivers. 40% uh, of bridges are structurally deficient. There are bottlenecks all over the place, and we can't rebuild it because it takes so long to get a permit, uh, and there's so many agencies that you have to get permits from that often projects don't even leave the, leave the drawing board. It'll take sometimes a decade to, to get a permit. It more than doubles the cost, just the red tape, more than doubles the cost. Paperwork reflects the demands of our citizens for service from their government. We have to push the reset button and um, it, it not only reset priorities to make sure the environmental review helps the environment, it doesn't hurt the environment, but also to give humans back the authority to use their common sense. What we need is to put humans back in charge. We cannot get rid of the jungle by cutting a few vines. Instead, we must clear it out and restore broad legal boundaries, a simpler framework that allows people to ask, what is the right thing to do here? Nothing works, especially government, without people taking responsibility. That's why we must put humans in charge, not mindless rules. That way, instead of a legal jungle, democracy can be an open avenue protected by law, a place where humans can thrive. In this program, I traveled to Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, and Texas. And I learned that we have the best government that money can buy. That's Travels and Traditions. I'm Bert Wolf, and I approve this message. Ah, uh, but wait, there's more. Whenever we edit one of our programs, we always end up with more good material than we can fit in. Interviews, stories, recipes. So we decided to put them on our website, BertWolf.com. Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem.